imagine we have two protons and two neutrons, right, making four nucleons. They are attracted to each other by the nuclear force, which is really, really strong. And when they're separated like this, they have nuclear potential energy, which means they want to move closer to each other because of the strong attractive force. So what happens if we just let them go? Well, they're going to move in toward each other because the, the attractive nuclear force pulls them in, and an atom is formed, a bound system. But these nucleons, which are now bound side by side, have just lost their initial nuclear potential energy. But wait a second, we know that energy can actually be lost. It can only be converted to some other form. So what's the energy converted into in this case? Well, we know from experiments that the potential energy is converted into light or electromagnetic radiation. But as Einstein famously discovered, energy is equivalent to mass. That means if these nucleons emit light, then they've just lost some energy. And because they've lost energy, they've also lost mass. Now, let's make up a number and say that each nucleon has lost three mega electron volts of energy. And because they've lost that energy, they are now bound together. So this amount of energy loss, which is needed to form a bound atom, is called the binding energy. Specifically, the binding energy is the energy released when the nucleus is formed. So in this case, the total binding energy is 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3, or 12 MeV. And per nucleon, the binding energy is just 3 mega electron volts. But what happens if we take another nucleon and we add it in to this nucleus? Well, it emits 3 mega electron volts of light, and this light carries away some of the mass. So now, we've increased the total binding energy by 3 more, putting it at 15 MeV. But the binding energy per nucleon is still 3 MeV, because that hasn't changed. So even though the binding energy has increased, even though this number increased, adding a nucleon hasn't made this nucleus any more stable. So a higher binding energy doesn't always mean the nucleus is more stable. In fact, I could take 12 more nucleons and add them all on, and this would make the total binding energy really huge, right? This will become 51 MeV. But as long as this number hasn't changed, it will still only take 3 MeV to break apart each nucleon from the atom. So to increase the stability of this atom, we need to increase the binding energy per nucleon. Right? So just because the binding energy is bigger, right, this jump to 51, doesn't mean the atom is more stable. Some bigger atoms are unstable, but they have a really high binding energy simply because they're so big and have so many nucleons. A better indication of stability is this value, the binding energy per nucleon, because that tells us how much work we have to do to knock free each component of the atom, of the nucleus. Now, the nucleons in an atom are bound together by the nuclear force, which is really, really strong, right? It's the Arnold Schwarzenegger of forces. But the nuclear force is also really, really short range, which means it only acts on neighboring nucleons. So let's look at a couple of examples. Here's a really small nucleus, which is made up of just two protons side by side. Let's draw the forces on the forces on this top proton here. Okay. We have electric repulsion between the two protons. So this top proton gets pushed away from this bottom proton. Okay. That's called the electrostatic force or the Coulomb force. Okay. 
but because the top proton is also so close in proximity to that bottom proton, there is an attraction of the nuclear force. So the bottom pro proton pulls the top proton down this way, and the combined effect is that the top proton is getting pulled toward the bottom proton, and they form a stable atom. But now let's look at a really big atom with tons of nucleons, like around 300 nucleons. What happens if we try to add another proton right here, right there? Well, thanks to how strong the nuclear force is at short distances, the added proton is, on the whole, attracted to its neighbors. So there's a net attraction this way with its neighboring nucleons, thanks to how strong that nuclear force is. But look over here at the outskirts, at the edge of this atom. Look over here. There are all these protons, which are much, much more distant from this proton. In fact, these protons are so far that the nuclear force doesn't act on this proton, right? So for, for these protons, these more distant protons, there's no nuclear force to dominate over the electric repulsion, and on the whole, each of these more distant protons repels this added proton with a small Coulomb force, a small electric repulsion. So the net effect between all of these pr forces on the added proton will be to eject it out away from the nucleus. So this short range of the nuclear force puts a size limit on how big atoms can get. In a small nucleus, the protons are all very close, and the nuclear force dominates that repulsive electric force. But, in a really large nucleus, the protons are far apart, and they're out of range of the nuclear force at the outskirts, or the edges, of the nucleus. So, at those edges, the repulsive electric force dominates the nuclear force. And in fact, the biggest you can get before nucleons start getting ejected is around 300. So no nuclei have more than about 300 nu nucleons. And this explains why larger nuclei get less and less stable. So if we look at the binding energy curve, right? Remember, on the left we have the binding energy per nucleon, which tells us stability. And as we move to the right on this curve, we are getting bigger and bigger atoms larger values, uh, larger nucleon numbers. So as we, uh, from about this point on, right, from about here, as we move to the right, we are getting smaller and smaller binding energy per nucleon values, right? The graph is going down, which means we're getting less and less stable. This is precisely because of what we just discussed as we start adding more and more protons they get farther and farther away, and the Coulomb force dominates over the nuclear force. So, here is uranium-235, and over here, let's say, is uh, thorium-233. They're around here. These may not be the exact locations, but that's pretty close to where they appear. We notice thorium-233 has a higher y value, it's higher up on the y value, uh, on the y axis, than ura uranium. So thorium-233 has a higher binding energy per nucleon than uranium-235. That means it's energetically favorable for uranium-235 to change into thorium-233. If there were some way for uranium to change into this thorium atom, then we would have something more stable. And energy, uh, excuse me, nature likes to move to a more stable state. Right? But just because it wants to move to a more stable state 
Just because it's ener energetically favorable doesn't make it possible. Only some changes are possible, and that's what we're going to discuss next, which is how do atoms become more stable? How do they change into different atoms to reach a more stable state with a higher binding energy per nucleon?